The most important work of your life is the work you do within your soul. This is Home Improvement for the Soul. Hello, and welcome to Home Improvement for the Soul. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maddie Cheers, and here with me today is my husband, Bob Vetter, who I'm very, very happy to welcome back. So this is a difficult time of year for a lot of people, the holidays, and I I thought we could talk about the concept of loneliness during this time of year, the dark night of the soul, and also the necessity maybe for ritual, or how how is it that people can deal with this time of year? We have friends who lost loved ones this time of year, and that changes the holidays forever. It makes it a much different experience. And then there are just people that when you're listening to all these wonderful songs, like I do all holiday long, Bob knows, I was just listening to to the old song Home for the Holidays on the radio as I got here. And I thought, you know, there are people that don't have a home to go to. So even though, of course, that's sad that they don't have home and family all year, it's especially emphasized now. So I wanted to look at at how we can how we as individuals how we can help those who really find this a very challenging time to get through. So for those of you that don't know, my husband Bob is a a healer and he helps people through times like these using many different techniques. So if you could just tell everybody, even though you've been on before, again, about some of the things you've studied, you work with when you're working with people who come to you maybe because they're feeling lonely or dispossessed at this time of year. Well, my academic background is as a cultural anthropologist, which led me to look at healing in non-Western cultures around the world. Specifically, the thing that I've spent the most time with is Mesoamerican curanderismo, which is a traditional healing system from Mexico and other countries in in the middle of the world of the middle of uh, the Americas. As far as other modalities that I do, it I also include work from Ericksonian hypnosis, neuro-linguistic programming, and other modern techniques. So the way that I work is one-on-one with people as well as in groups in uh, healing ceremonies that include Temascal, which is the Mesoamerican sweat lodge. So people, when they come to me, sometimes it's as simple as a limpia, which is a, a cleansing ceremony, where we take the presenting problem and then ceremonialize it in order to create a change from whatever the current problematic state is to move towards something that they do want. So that's what healing is. Healing is becoming whole out of the brokenness of our experience. I And I think that is the most important thing. I, when I look at what we're missing in our culture, a lot of what we're missing is community, is family, is rites of passage within these other cultures. When you experience a rite of passage of some sort, and not just death, which obviously you're dealing with loss, but every rite of passage at every age represents gain and loss. You know, if you, you go into puberty, there's a big ceremony around that. But within that ceremony is the recognition that there's the loss of childhood, the freedom, the the joyfulness. There's more responsibility that you're accepting because and the community is celebrating the fact that you're accepting having greater responsibility and a greater sense of reciprocity with the people around you in your community, in your faith. So many different faiths have those kinds of rites of passage, and it represents that you, you've you lost something, but you're gaining something maybe even greater. And I think that with the loss of ceremony and rites of passage, it is very difficult in our culture for people to deal with 
the idea of of other people's joy during a, a time that represents their connection to family, that represents their involvement in a faith. So when you are working with somebody like that and when you are introducing a ceremony to someone, what is that? What what is that and how do you go about introducing that to someone who maybe has no experience with anything like that before? Well, the limpia is the, the ceremonialization and it utilizes a variety of different symbols. And the reason that symbol is so important is because it puts us in touch with something that transcends our normal day-to-day experience. Our normal day-to-day experience deals with things that are concrete in the physical world, whereas each one of us is on our own journey of looking for meaning. And what symbols do is they connect us with a power that is greater than ourselves. A symbol, by definition, is something that in, that evokes a variety of responses. It's not a one-to-one correspondence. It's a way of interfacing with the ineffable, of something that is the beyond. You could call it sacred if you want. Mm. Uh, so symbols allow us to touch upon that in a way that we can't in the way that we use language. Language is, is very specific, whereas a symbol carries a variety of meanings. So we use symbols as a way of experiencing something deeper than our normal day-to-day life. And that's, that is something we're losing also. I listened to a lecture by the very well-known Clarissa Pinkola Estes, and Dr. Estes was talking about the loss of those symbols that connect us, the loss and and how for eons, since there have been people at least, we have had these symbols that have helped us identify exactly that, identify the sacred, understand that there's something bigger and maybe better beyond ourselves, or if nothing else, something bigger that we are connected to. And so when when we lose that idea of that connection to something beyond ourselves, then we are, we are in danger of losing our souls. And I think that's why we have this sort of epidemic of loneliness now, is because people are looking for something to connect to. And very often we would recommend that you join join a spiritual circle join join a church join a synagogue join go go to some place where people are actively celebrating life the love of life the good and the bad of life you know or the the difficult of life go to a place where there are the rituals where there there is an expression of faith in something greater than ourselves and that expression of faith i think too makes us want to be greater than we are it gives us our sense of morality and it also gives us a, the a connection to like what you are saying the archetypes like we have these these archetypes. We have the mother archetype, the father archetype. We have all these archetypes that seem to be fading away as we change language and we change, we change the everything. I mean, everything is changing and change is hard to deal with when it comes very fast. And we're looking at things to worship that are things. We're looking at things. It seems to me we become much more materialistic in the last few years and not not in touch with our connection to each other and to the great spirit seems that way to the creator that we're pulling away from that we have for the first time on earth more people who are disconnected from sort of some sort of faith-based community than ever before something like 30 percent true i i mean i think that We live in a world increasingly where consumerism is replacing the 
what was a, a prior commitment to understanding ourselves and constructing meaning. So when when we're dealing with somebody who is feeling lost and alone and feeling like life may be meaningless to them, when when we and we have had people like this in our spiritual circles. We have had people come into to Temescal or come into sweat lodge or smoke lodge and express the fact that they feel lost and they feel disconnected, which is why they've taken this step of coming into a circle. And then often those same people end up meeting with you privately. So when you are meeting with somebody who's come to you like that and you've got at your fingertips the this knowledge of Ericksonian hypnosis, this knowledge of limpia, how, how is it that you advise somebody or you decide which is the best technique to go with? Well, or, that depends on the moment. I yeah. mean, what, what I think is more important is to go back a step further oh. and see what, what is the meaning behind the feeling of meaninglessness. <laughs> you know, so what is it that causes somebody to go on this quest in the first place? Because let's face it. If everything is fine, you don't need to seek somebody out for healing. Right. Usually it's when you bottom out where you realize that things are not the way that you thought they were. Right. That maybe you haven't experienced the kind of material success that you want or maybe you do and you find that it didn't offer you the it didn't provide you with the fulfillment that you thought it would. The point is it's a moment of crisis that leads you to want to find change in the first place, to which I respond, congratulations on hitting bottom. <laughs> if that's what it took you to get back to an understanding of your life as a project of finding meaning, then yay for that. Yes, exactly. Yay for that. And one of the things that I wish I could remember whose, whose talk this was that I was listening to, but one of the things that um, this gentleman was talking about was that some of, some of what we see now where people seem to be rushing into this group or that group and then holding so tight onto, I'm right, you're wrong, I'm right, you're wrong, and the need to do that has to do with losing a sense of belonging. So you rush into these groups, you adopt whatever it is they're saying, and then you find that, oh, well, this isn't, nothing's changing. You know, I'm, I'm not winning. They're not winning. We're all losing. So then again, you get to that dark night of the soul. And I agree with you. Congratulations for hitting bottom. Because what, what other journey is there in life other than to find meaning in life for you? Well, you, you started by talking about the isolation, mm. the sense of aloneness. And it maybe is never more obvious than during the holiday season, but it's there all the time. Yes. Why? Because we, we see constant images in our media, in our discussions of the father knows best, you know, of the, the ideal – the ideal holiday celebration that you see in a right. TV commercial. So when my experience doesn't match up to that, it throws into question, well, what's wrong with me? Why don't I have the family with 2.5 children and the Christmas tree with exactly the right lights and everything else? Why don't Why doesn't my experience match up to the one that I see in all of these, all of this imagery that surrounds me and is in my face during this time of year. Yeah. So if that's what it takes to question, then that's a good thing. Yeah, <laughs> totally. And I was talking to a, a young friend of mine who was saying how she, she has friends giving, you know, and that's a wonderful thing. I think there are a lot of people that are making up for the fact that they don't quite have a great time at their family's house or they have no family by having these things like Friendsgiving. We used to do it on the Saturday of Thanksgiving when we were younger. <laughs> and, um, 
And it is a wonderful celebration, but like she pointed out, on the other hand, she also has a very close-knit family, and her Thanksgiving Day is very wonderful. Whereas there are people where even though the friends giving is wonderful, it's like you said, they're still seeing that there's something missing. And they have to be led into a place where they can fill in that space with, with some kind of love and acceptance of themselves. And that, I think, is that dark night of the soul, that existential crisis, which you can explain a lot better than I can, <laughs> that whole existential crisis. Yeah, well, the, the dark night of the soul is when everything is th- thrown into question. When the things that I have habitually done over the course of my lifetime no longer offer me fulfillment. And the existential crisis is if I don't get fulfillment in the way that I did, who am I? Mm. Where do I turn? Is it all just meaningless? If I don't find meaning right now, is there a meaning? Maybe there isn't. Maybe I'm floating in space. Maybe I'm just dust. So the point is that the questioning is the dark night of the soul. The dark night of the soul is the the sense that I don't have something solid to hold on to. Right. That it, it forces me to question everything. Yep. That makes it the dark night of the soul. You know, as long as if, if we want to use this notion of dark and light, we we think of light as our goal. We all want to be in the light. Right. And we think of darkness as something bad. In fact, in, in some circles, darkness suggests evil. Mm. That is not what it means in this context. What it means in this context is for the light to be hidden. Right. The light is not available to me in this moment. What is available to me in this moment is questioning. And so the dark night of the soul, as anxiety-producing as it is, as troubling as it can be, is also an opportunity for big, major change on the inside to commit to a life of constructing meaning. And now now I'm on, on shaky ground because some people will look to meaning <laughs> to come from cultural and religious forms. Right. And for people who do that, I, I have great respect for them. Personally, I don't look at it that way. Personally, I think that meaning is an activity that I do on my own. I can do it in community, but it's for me to decide what is meaning for me. Right. And I think I, I totally agree with you. And I think that when a person does ask that kind of question, that they will then seek out something that gives their life something greater, that gives their life meaning, that shows them what meaning is for them. What they can, and ultimately, when you resolve the, the the dark places, when you go there, and resolve those things inside of you, you ultimately raise yourself up, and that raises up the whole community, because then you are healthy and available to give your best to others. Yes, and the more that we give to others, the more our own experience is enriched. So when if somebody is uh, finding distress about something like this, what I say is, okay, if you want to experience, if you want to receive love in your life, go give it. Mm -hmm. If during the holidays you are distressed by the fact that you don't have a family, I say give to somebody else. Really? And that's the way that you receive. So what are the ways that you could volunteer to be there for someone else? Exactly. There's 
soup kitchens galore. There's all kinds of things that you can do and help out with. And I remember, you know, because I've said this to you, but a long, long time ago, when I took a, a course, it used to be a free course offered by um, executives who retired, the Service Corps of Retired Executives was what it was called. And it was all these, mostly men at that time, because we're talking back in like the 80s, it, early 80s, that um, that had gotten together and formed this organization where they would hold like meetings weekly meetings was all over the country where people who wanted to start a business like me could come to them and could hear from experts had their what was their life like how did they get to the point where they were the ceo of one of the biggest corporations in the world you know and what did they go through and to a person every single one of them said volunteer Every one of them said, and the one man I remember in particular said that, you know, he he volunteered, uh, you know, his parents are like pushing him, go volunteer somewhere, it'll, you know, it'll, it'll, at least you're doing something, you know, go volunteer. And he said the most amazing thing about volunteering is that you really do start to feel like you're a part of something. You're a part of some organization that needs your help. You're a part of some community that needs your help. But the other plus side for him was his very first job came out of what he chose to volunteer for. And ultimately, the creation of his business came out of his volunteer work where he saw a need for people to have connection to a community that could help them write their resumes that could help them get jobs that could so from all of that and and all the all the executives up on the stage are like nodding and they're all going yes 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 that some of their best ideas if even their entire corporations were formed out of having been a volunteer being out in the community being of service and then also i think those kind of people create a corporation that is of service so the wonderful thing about that is that you you end up with people who are leading something where they really feel like they are they are part of their employees involvement so they're looking for a particular type of employee who wants to work on a team and there's a lot of that going on in Europe now you know you and I both know from where Kyle works our our nephew at this gaming company and his wife Jess that they the first thing they look for in hiring is somebody who can work on a team and these executives expressed how how life-changing it was to to have a volunteer job as opposed to just sit around the house and do nothing. And thank God for that guy's parents, though I don't remember what the name of his company was all these years later, but thank God for the, his parents that he he kicked, they kicked him out of the house and said, well, if you're not going to get a job, you're going to at least volunteer. Go over there. Go do that. You know, you can't just lay around here. You have to have a purpose. You have to have um, some kind of meaning. And all of that led to a huge change for him. So let's rein this in. Okay, shall let's we? rein this in, shall we? <laughs> so we, what we're saying here to really wrap it up and summarize is that the holiday season is very often for many people a time of discomfort. Mm-hmm. Discomfort because what they experience is not the image that they see in the media of the ideal family. Right. Sometimes it can be somebody in what appears to be the ideal family who feels that as much, if not more so, than somebody who is literally isolated. So the isolation and the aloneness lead to questioning. Who am I? What am I doing? What is my life all about? How am I connected or how am I disconnected? So if disconnection is what causes the suffering in our life, the question is what are the ways that we have of creating connection, reconnecting. One of the ways that we've been talking about today is by volunteering, by instead of 
going for what I want to receive. I instead give. Mm. I give from my heart. There are other ways that we can discuss at other times, but today is to look at the internal journey in terms of how do I construct meaning in my life, what are the questions that I'm asking based out of my suffering, and then how do I go back into community in order to give first and in the process reconnect with a new sense of community, a new sense of family. Ah, I love this. I love that. That that is wonderful and beautiful. And amazingly, I asked this question <laughs> before I wrote this poem, which as everybody who listens knows, I always end with a poem, and as you know. So lately, I, I have been asking questions, and I, I asked, why grief? And I got a little poem, and I do think that part of this going in, this this dark night of the soul, part of what people are experiencing is, it is grieving. And last week, I talked a lot about this process of grief grief as a gateway to peace and so i think that that we are sort of grieving when we're feeling alone and then we go inside and try to look at where does all of this come from and how do we get meaning so i i had asked why grief this afternoon before we talked and here's what i got except i have to put on my reading glasses first so excuse me, dear audience, while I find my reading glasses, because what do I always lose? My keys and my glasses. Ask my husband, he'll tell you. So here it is. Why grief? The grief of love, the growth of truth, is where we touch our inner youth. This silent call to right the wrong is heard so we can sing along. To songs of love and sounds of light, that help to set the future right. We seek to shine a newer day and let the soul come out to play. In joy and love and sweet we reward, it is that world we're moving toward. I love that little poem, and I think it relates perfectly to what we're talking about. So I hope some of what we've talked about has helped you if you feel like you need some some help at this time of year and I hope you know that we love you that's why we're here we're here because we love you and we're hoping that everybody out there who listens finds a beautiful and wonderful something out of this holiday season even if it's the opportunity to go inside and question and that's what leads you to your best self so thank you so much for listening I hope you all have a beautiful wonderful week till we See you again next time, and thank you. Thank you for being here with with us. <laughs> thank you so much. I'm Maddie Cheers, and if you'd like to get in touch with me, you can go to Maddie Cheers, M-A-D-D-I-C-H-E-E-R-S dot com, and sign up and find out more about my book that will be coming out with a bunch of these poems that have been 108 of them over the years that have been delivered to me by the divine. And also, if you want to get a hold of Bob, Bob, you want to give everybody your contact info, please? Sure. Lots of healing resources on my website that are free. Go to bobvetter.com. Again, Bob, B-O-B, Vetter, V-E-T-T-E-R, dot com. And thank you again. Thank you certainly to everybody here at Paradise Studios and Long Strong Island. <laughs> thank you to my producer, Bobby Lacerra. Always, always, always deep thanks. Have a wonderful week, everybody. Bye now. Thank you for joining us for Home Improvement for the Soul. If you'd like more information, please go to womensoneness.com or maddiecheers.com. That's womensoneness.com or maddiecheers.com. See you on the next episode.